Hello there, and welcome to Field Study, an exploration of food and the landscape. So it's sunrise here on the beautiful Isle of Wight, and I'm up with the blackbirds. Um, it's an unusual hour for me to be out and about, but the idea today is for me to forage for my breakfast. First things first, I'm going to make myself a cup of coffee, and uh, then we're going to get going. The sun's starting to rise and uh, as it creeps over the horizon, the edges of the clouds are turning this beautiful peachy colour and I can see patches of, of blue sky. We've got a few hours of this and then I think we've got like a, a rain front coming in and it's sort of settling in for the next week. Um, but we'll see. There we go, there's your weather update. You thought you got away with that one, didn't you? Uh, so the morning is getting underway and I'm going to take you on a walk in the beautiful British countryside and we're going to see what we can forage for my breakfast. I'm hoping for something mushroomy. I know time of year, place we're going, there should be something there. So I'm not worried about going home hungry, but I am worried about it being delicious. So <laughs> fingers crossed for something absolutely delicious, uh, but we'll see what we get. So without any further ado, uh, let's fill up my foraging bag and then take it back to Field Study HQ and I'm going to be cooking something lovely with it, hopefully. Fingers crossed. <laughs> So I was walking along the, uh, this lovely track here and it's sort of lined on either side with um, beautiful oak trees. Uh, and I found exactly what I was hoping to find this morning. And this is gonna make a delicious breakfast. So this is the amethyst deceiver or Lucaria amethystium, amethystinum, something like that. It will be written below. Um, and for a bright purple mushroom, it's uh, quite well camouflaged on the forest floor. And this is a delicious edible mushroom. So with all members of the Lucarium family, uh, you're looking for this slight wooliness on the, on the stem. Uh, and this mushroom is quite distinctive in the fact that it has these bright purple gills uh, when it's freshly picked, the same as the cap. So the mushroom will discolour uh, with age and maybe go slightly pa paler. Uh, it might take on a, a sort of a, a brownie tinge on the top like that. But it will always, when it's young, have these lovely purple gills underneath the same colour as its bright purple cap. So there's one other purple mushroom like this in the woods um, that you might get this confused for, and that is the lilac fibre cap. Uh, so learn that one before you go out. I'll link a brilliant uh, ID video for this in the, the description below from Wild Foods UK, and he actually puts them side by side, the lilac fibre cap and this, the amethyst deceiver. And physically they are quite different, so you should be able to learn it quite quickly. So I'd say after you watch this video, go and watch that one um, just before you go out picking these. So you'll find these beautiful tiny ones uh, like I've got here, like these little ear pick ones, uh, and you'll find them larger like this. When they get slightly larger, they have a little divot, like a little uh, belly button thing that appears in the middle of the cap. Uh, so that's quite cute. The stems, when you cut them like a cross section, um, are hollow on the inside, like a tube, like a straw. Um, and they are quite fibrous, so just personal preference. You can eat them, uh, some people prefer not to, and just eat the caps. But the thing is with these, uh, they grow in vast quantities. So if you find one of these, start rummaging around on the forest floor because the likelihood is there'll be hundreds of them, probably hiding within the bracken, uh, popping out from the leaf litter. So get down low and look across. Uh, I find sometimes if the, the forest is dark, a torch can really illuminate the, the bright, vivid purple of these because they are quite good at camouflaging themselves for a, a bright purple mushroom. Um, so yeah, this is the Amethyst Deceiver and I am very happy because this is gonna make my breakfast a hundred times better. But unfortunately, a small handful of Amethyst Deceivers doesn't make a meal in itself. 
So uh, I'm going to carry on the walk and get into the woods behind me here uh, and see if there's any other mycological goodies, any uh, other beautiful mushrooms that I can add to this in order to make myself a lovely hearty breakfast. Might see if we can pick up a few plants along the way as well, you know, just to add a little bit of balance and colour and variety. Uh, so we'll see what we find. So this pathway here is absolutely lined with uh, beautifully delicate sorrel leaves. So this is common sorrel, Rumex acetosa, and it's got a, a deliciously uh, tart, lemony flavor. It's got quite distinctive spear-shaped leaves with these two tail bits near the end. This time of year, you shouldn't get it mistaken with its common look-alike, which is lords and ladies. So I think our luck with weather this morning is just about to change. <laughs> um, yeah, my phone's just buzzed. Rain's starting soon. That ominous notification. But more than that, the sky started to sheet over with grey and we're getting down drafts of wind um, as the storm front sort of makes its way in. Oh, right on cue. <laughs> and it's just started raining. Brilliant. Doesn't matter though, it's good for the mushrooms. And what's good for the mushrooms is good for me. Um, so we're in this lovely patch of chestnut and oak uh, with a few birch trees. Uh, so all of these things are good for mushrooms. So lots of the edible fungi in the UK uh, are what is called mycorrhizal, which means that they need to have a relationship with um, tree roots or the roots of a plant in order to be able to survive and feed themselves. Um, so mycorrhizal fungi attach themselves to the, the roots of trees and plants um, in order to sustain themselves. So the tree will photosynthesize and give the fungi energy and in turn the fungi will help the tree absorb more nutrients by extending its root network out. Um, it will also help the trees communicate to each other. So there are lots of good edible mycorrhizal fungi in the UK uh, including things like your porcini and uh, other belites and things that people look for. Um, but mushrooms are choosy with the trees that they choose. Uh, certain species of fungi will choose certain species of tree. So good trees to look under for mycorrhizal fungi are oak trees, beech trees, uh, birch trees have quite a lot, chestnuts all right, um, broadleaf trees like that. Trees that aren't very good for mycorrhizal fungi are your ash tree, uh, all of the maple family like your sycamores and your field maples. If you're in a, a stand of sycamore trees, then the forest floor below you will pretty much be dead mycologically. So, uh, so yeah, look somewhere else. But here we've got these beautiful gnarled old oak trees and I'm very hopeful that I'll be able to find something just to bulk up my uh, foraging bag. Otherwise, I'm going to have to uh, have quite a large lunch to make up for the meagre breakfast that I'm preparing myself. So there's also a, uh, a tradition in certain parts of the UK uh, that you have to catch 12 falling leaves in the autumn uh, to give yourself good luck for the year ahead. Um, so <laughs> there's quite a few leaves falling behind me here, so I might try and catch a few today to get a head start because so far this year I haven't caught any. So yeah, catch 12 falling leaves, uh, pop them in an envelope, put them in your desk and you'll have good luck for the year to come. Probably a load of old nonsense, but I like nonsense. Why not, you know? Why blooming not? Absolutely typical. As soon as I'm trying to catch a leaf, there's no leaves. <laughs> Oh, forget it. <laughs> forget it. This could go on all day, I'll never get my breakfast. Come on. The rain's blurred out the hills. It's really starting to come down now. So this little guy may have just saved my breakfast. So this little guy is in a group of mushrooms called the Belites. 
Uh, so we know that he's a Belit because he has a stem and a cap and he's grown from the ground and underneath the cap, uh, instead of gills, we have this sponge-like network of pores. Now there is a quick test that you can do in order to find out whether the belete that you have is edible or not. And that is the simple rule, no red, no blue. In the UK, the poisonous uh, members of this family uh, will have red coloration on the stem and on the pores, and if you slice them in half, they will stain blue, like a really, really vivid ink blue. It really is quite beautiful uh, and noticeable as well. They don't, they don't mess around. Uh, it goes proper vivid blue. So no red, no blue. Uh, so I don't know exactly what species this one is. He's not a porcini because on the stipe he doesn't have that white reticulation and his cap is slightly too dark. Um, but he isn't red and he isn't staining blue, so we know that we've got something that is edible. Now there is one, and there's always one, uh, which will... <laughs> it's not an exception to the rule because it is not a toxic mushroom. However, it is not edible because it tastes horrible. And that is the bitter belief. So the bitter belief, as the name suggests, has a horrible bitter flavour that's sort of like bile or sick. Uh, so you really don't want that to be anywhere near any of your food. Um, but this one, I believe he may be a bay belief. So it just means when I get home, I'm going to have to look in my books, do a little bit of book work and try and find a positive ID for him uh, before cooking him up and eating him. He smells lovely and nutty. There's almost like a vanilla thing going on. He's mushroomy and he's going to be absolutely delicious and a good way to bulk up my amethyst deceivers. So the rain started hammering down out there, <laughs> but I've got to make my way home, probably get soaked along the way, uh, but I'll see you guys back at Field Study HQ where I'm going to be cooking up a hearty, delicious mushroom breakfast. Stay tuned. Got home and uh, I am having a look in this, which is one of my favourite books, to try and get a positive ID on the, uh, on the mushroom that we found. So. So this book is fantastic. Roger Phillips, uh, the late Roger Phillips, is um, well known for being an absolute... Oh, and the cat. You're right. Want to learn about some mushrooms? <laughs> so the late Roger Phillips uh, was an incredible mycologist, and he compiled this, which is pretty much the, the field guide that gets recommended to most beginners. And it's got expertly photographed pictures of lots of the common mushrooms and fungi uh, in the UK. Really not helping, cat. <laughs> Good. Uh, so we are looking for the Belites. So that is in <laughs> Thistle. <laughs> this is Thistle the cat, by the way, and she's caught her first mouse today, so I'm very proud. So there's the agarics. These are the ones that we were looking at uh, when we were looking for our field mushrooms. So yeah, lots of delicious ones in the agarics. So having a field guide like this at home really is an excellent resource. And it just shows you how many uh, sort of species there are out there that can look sort of similar to each other. But it has um, excellent notes on uh, physical differences and ways to check uh, what species you've got. And it can be a really handy resource to, um, to identify down to species. Uh, so we are looking for the Belites, so that is somewhere, if I remember rightly, near the back here. Yes, here we go, Cantharellus and Belitus. Belitus, uh, we're in the mushrooms with pores section, um, and you see here, that is your, that's your penny bun or your set, Belitus edulis. So that is the, the porcini mushroom, the one that everyone's after. So the one that we found today, I think, was a bay belete, but also having looked in this, uh, I got quite excited because I thought it might be a dark sep, uh, just because of the, the sort of colour of the stipe. So I posted some pictures of it onto uh, one of my local mushroom groups and they got back to me. Uh, a couple of the uh, mycologists that are on there said whilst it does look superficially like a, um, like a dark sep, uh, it is most likely, 99% sure, a babelite. And they told me something which was interesting, which was that although the, the pores usually do stain blue, and all the ones that I foraged for before have this blue staining pore structure on it, uh, it doesn't necessarily stain blue. So apparently the blue staining on the pores of the Babel Eat can be uh, governed by the humidity in the air and lots of other factors. Uh, so that isn't necessarily an indicator for species. So we've got a lovely Babel Eat to cook up for breakfast and I'm getting absolutely starving. So let's go to Field Study HQ and cook up something good. 
So we're back at Field Study HQ and it is finally time to get cooking. So we've got a pan, lovely cast iron pan here that's heating up. It's got a little bit of oil in the bottom. And the first thing to do is to fry off a little chunk of lovely seeded bread. This is nice, it's slightly stale, so good for toasting and frying and that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, we'll make a perfect conduit for our lovely mushrooms. So whilst that's getting some color on it, we're going to prepare our lovely mushrooms. So first with these lovely bay beliefs that we found, um, and they have been slightly eaten on the top by some slugs, uh, cause we aren't the only things that find these uh, delicious things, delicious. Uh, so what we're gonna do is just cut these the babyly is uh, the least likely of this sort of mushroom to uh, get maggot infestation, which isn't something you really want to think about when you're cooking breakfast. Uh, but if you look in here, it's got lovely firm white flesh. There is no blue discoloration and it hasn't been eaten by any little bugs. So we're just going to carry on slicing this up into lovely big slices. So this is taking on some lovely colour at the bottom. Look at that. Beautiful decadent fried bread, lovely stuff. So now onto the amethyst deceivers. So you'll see on the bottom of these, uh, they've sort of got a little bit of uh, mycelial root structure that's sort of clinging to the bottom there. So you just want to cut that off. You don't want to be eating the soil. So yeah, just clean that off. Uh, the rest of the mushroom is pretty much good to go. Again, these don't really suffer from being attacked or eaten by bugs. Uh, some of the bits of stalk can be a little bit fibrous. Uh, so just discard them if they look too tough and woody. Because that again is something that we don't really want in our lovely mushroom dish. These two little beauties. Look at that little guy there. What an absolutely beautiful mushroom. Almost a shame to eat them. So there we go. We have our amethyst deceivers with their beautiful uh, deep amethyst purple gills. Uh, and then we have this rather chunky looking babyly who is smelling absolutely fantastic right now. Uh, plenty of foragers will tell you that the babyly is almost equally as good as the porcini. So the porcini is famous just because of the name, but this, uh, the babyly is one to really look out for. And where it's more common than the porcini, uh, it is one that will grace your foraging bags as soon as you learn it. So there we go. Right, let us get cooking. So this fried bread is looking absolutely beautiful. So we're going to pop that down here into our bowl. Just a touch more oil into the pan there, and then it is in with our beautiful babyleets. So, just pop your babyleets in. The slightly firmer flesh will mean that these will take ever so slightly longer to cook than the amethyst deceivers. Oh, and as soon as they hit the pan, that is an incredible smell. Now, unfortunately, I have some sad news. The, uh, the lovely amethyst jewel color of your uh, amethyst deceivers will turn brown as soon as it hits the heat of the pan. Sorry, there's nothing you can do about it. Although I have uh, seen people pickle these and preserve that um, beautiful amethyst color. And uh, that on top of a cheese board or a salad or something, it, it looks the business. Um, but I haven't tried it myself, to be honest. Uh, but these will go brown after they hit the pan. Um, it's the same way that purple sprouting broccoli will lose its purple color. The, uh, the pigment will degrade as soon as it hits the heat. Nothing you can do, but they're still going to be absolutely delicious. It's starting to take on a little bit of color. It's starting to break down a little bit. Absolutely wonderful stuff. So next we're going to add our amethyst deceivers into the pan like so. And there we go, there's that one there, along with a little bit of our homemade sea salt. And if you're interested in uh, how I made this, then there is a video that I'll link up in the top. Um, it's one of my first videos that I made actually, so go and check that out if you want to know how to make uh, sea salt. So whilst we're waiting for that to cook down nicely, uh, I'm going to introduce you to a little secret weapon of mine. So this is uh, blackberry, cardamom and chilli balsamic vinegar. Uh, and it's made here on the Isle of Wight and it is absolutely delicious. Uh, it's slightly sweet. 
And if you add it into a mushroom dish like this, uh, it will add a lovely glaze on top of the mushrooms. You'll get that lovely uh, sort of umami brown thing with some sweetness and some acidity. Absolutely lovely. So we'll be adding a little splash of that in a second. But first, uh, I want to use this sorrel that we picked. So sorrel has like a lovely uh, lemony citrus acidic sort of thing going on and I think that will just elevate this dish just slightly. Also add something a little bit green, you know, we've got to look after ourselves with all this uh, fried bread and fried mushrooms and stuff. So you just want a little bit of something leafy in there just to convince yourself that you're not going to, uh, you know, keel over halfway through the day. <laughs> this is breakfast after all. So there we go, just going to sprinkle that lovely sorrel in there. Give it a little shake in. And then this, our lovely secret ingredient, this blackberry, cardamom and chili vinegar. So just a little slug of that in. So what will happen is as this cooks down a little bit more, that uh, vinegar will start to evaporate off and act as like a glaze for the mushrooms. And it is gonna taste absolutely incredible, trust me. So there we go. Those are almost ready and I am just about ready to eat. Uh, it's been an absolutely lovely morning, worth the early start, and very exciting for a minute when I thought I had a dark set, uh, but that was snatched away from me cruelly. Um, so let's get this plated up. Oh, lovely wild mushrooms. And put them on that lovely bit of toast that we got. Oh, yes. <laughs> So there we go. And then to finish it off, just garnish it with a little bit more of that lovely sorrel that we picked. And then uh, a little bit of lovely American land cress from the garden. So there we go. That is my glazed wild mushrooms on toast. I'm sure you can agree it looks absolutely incredible. And apart from the, uh, the bread and the balsamic vinegar, all of the ingredients were free and from this beautiful landscape, which uh, is unbelievably satisfying. The only food miles are the steps that I took this morning to go and gather it, and that makes me feel unbelievably good. So thank you for joining me on today's little adventure. If you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up and hit subscribe for more foraging videos and recipes from this beautiful landscape. I'm gonna go and devour this now. <laughs> If any questions at all, please leave them in the comment section below and I shall see you next week. Take care. <laughs> oh, I look like an idiot, don't I? Okay, right. We've got to catch a leaf. There's one, there's one. There's one. Not quick enough. Oh, forget it.